says time for a change. Enough is enough. Churches on every corner. We are determined. We are not backing up. We are going to say. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. These are the words of Jesus recorded for us in the Gospel of John. Paul would use this kind of adoption language as well in his letter to the church at Galatia, where he would write this. He says, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive, quote, adoption to sonship. At the beginning of our Orphan Sunday sermon today, what I want to lay before you is what the New Testament declares to be your story and declares to be my story for those of us who would say we are in Christ. That if you are in Christ, according to the New Testament, that your story is an adoption story. That you were alienated from God because of your sin. But God, who is rich and mercy, who saw an orphaned people, said, I want to redeem those people. I want to bring them back. I want to adopt them into my family. And that is the reason the text tells us that Jesus came, in essence, to pay the price of our adoption with his own blood, taking the punishment that we deserved so that we could go free, be brought in, reconciled to the Father, and be able to relate to God as he always desired, always intended, as a father, as a father. And so this adoption wasn't cheap. It was quite costly. And it should then be no surprise to us whatsoever if this is, in fact, our story, that God's heart, as revealed in the text, would then tell us that he cares deeply for orphans. James, who is generally believed to have been the brother or what we would call the half-brother of Jesus, who had become a prominent leader in the early church, in his book, known by his name, James would write about what true religion is to look like. 
And I don't know about you, but, but I feel like in our culture today, our heads are easy to spin because there's so many things c- contending to be true religion. And we look at it, we're like, I don't know, that doesn't look right, that doesn't look good, this feels off about that. And, and he gives this just simple description in what has become probably the key text for what should be um, Orphan Sunday. And, and that would be James 1.27, or really anything dealing with this subject, rather. And here's what he writes. Religion that God our Father, and I'll pause there again, he's addressing God as Father, which sounds so familiar to you if you have grown up in Christianity, or you've been a Christian for a long time, or you've read the Bible, we get this repeated that, that we're to call God Father. Even when Jesus teaches how when Jesus teaches us how to pray, he says, Pray then like this, our Father. Well, how is he our Father? By way of adoption. By way of adoption. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. So he's going to lay out here. You want to know what real good religion looks like? Here it is. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is the statement that he gives that's, by the way, it's in our Bibles. So this isn't some dude's commentary on it. This is what we believe that God is the author of this ultimately behind James as he writes this. So this isn't just James' take in our opinion. We believe this is God's take. And when he goes to describe religion that is pure and faultless, pure meaning it's the real deal. It's authentic. It's the right thing. Faultless meaning not only is it the right thing, but it's without blemish. It's without tarnish. It's, it's, it's good. It's right. The first four words we get. To look after orphans. To look after orphans. It's the first thing that we get. And so here's the reality. Churches around the globe are gathered this morning on Orphan Sunday to declare that these kids matter. That they matter. And if you believe the scriptures and you're in Christ, then what you believe is the adoption story is actually your story. And, and, that, and that God deeply cares about these kids who need homes. The genesis for Orphan Sunday can actually be traced back to Africa, to a poor, impoverished area that had been ravaged by AIDS. And so they have orphans in, in, in abundance in this geographical area. And one pastor of a poor church has the audacity to tell his congregation that in light of their own problems, they need to do something about the orphan crisis. And so people on that Sunday would respond by giving sacrificially, some even, even taking off their very shoes and putting it in the offering to say, no, these kids matter and we need to do something about it. Since that time, much has been done in the name of Jesus to love and serve these kids, but much more needs to be done. The statistic is that worldwide, we have 17.6 million children who have lost both parents, or what statisticians might call double orphans. And we have 150 million children worldwide who have lost either one parent or both parents. But the Christian Alliance for Orphans would tell us that these statistics are, in a sense, misleading in that they're actually worse than they appear. And here's why. One of the greatest weaknesses in these global orphan estimates is that they include only orphans that are currently living in homes. They do not count the estimated two to eight plus million children living in institutions, nor do current estimates include the vast number of children who are living on the streets, exploited for labor, victims of trafficking, or participating in armed conflict. And so the stats are likely significantly worse than what would at first meet the eye. Closer to home, we have over 400,000 kids in foster care in the United States. Children 
go into foster care due to abuse, neglect, abandonment, and even exploitation. A couple other stats we have for you. 50% of youth who, quote, age out of foster care never graduate from high school. And 40% of youth leaving the foster care system will be homeless in 18 months. In our tri-county area, which would include Volusia County, we have over 900 kids in out-of-home care. We are typically short 50 to 75 homes in our area, and I have been told that our specific geography here in Volusia is actually the worst of the tri-county area, is my understanding. And the reality is that we don't always see these kids, do we? I mean, we we can go about our, our lives and not realize that there are these kids who need these homes, but they're there and they matter. And we believe Jesus cares deeply about these children. And we also believe that this is deeply connected to the heart of God as it is deeply connected to the gospel. I was actually at a pastor's conference not long ago, and I was um, kind of outside the conference, and I, and I was speaking with a pastor that I had met before, and he started to tell me about another pastor's church at the conference. And it wasn't a very large church. It was a church of roughly 200 and something people on a given Sunday. And he said, but I went to their church, and there's all these foster kids walking around. He's like, I could tell that because the kids are not the same color as the parents. And I know how biology works, you know? And, uh, and he was, he's like, they have like 25 families in their congregation of like 200 and something that are foster parents. And I'm like, wow, that's really a remarkable stat. So I, I bump into the pastor of that church that I had heard about later at the conference. And I was like, Hey, I heard you have a lot of, of like foster families in, in your congregation. I think that's great. Like, and, and he's like, yeah, we do. And I was like, well, did you preach on it? And with what could have been interpreted as a little bit of attitude, he goes, no. He goes, taking in kids is like one of the most obvious expressions of the gospel that there is. And that was his explanation. He's like, no, I preach the gospel And people connect the dots that this deeply matters to Jesus. And I want you to see one more video before uh, we come out and talk about what we as the people of God can do about this crisis. Please direct your attention to the screens. The deepest suffering is not physical pain, but isolation. And it's felt by every orphan child and foster youth. Separated, alone, without. The world's orphans were suffering, but then came Orphan Sunday. The church that I was pastoring in Kalingalinga was a poor church. I would see children coming to church without shoes. I felt we should have a day as a church. This humble church set apart a day to care for orphans and their sacrifice began a vision for orphaned and vulnerable children everywhere. I just think this is a miracle. This is the doing of God. On the other side of the world, another pastor heard the call for children in foster care. And Bishop Blake said to his congregation, who will stand with me today for the kids? And a lady stood and said, I will. And then another stood and said, I will. Within three months, 39 children were placed in Bishop Blake's church. The vision grew. It echoed from church to church, from country to country, and God's great love changed lives and families. It's unimaginable that I could love him more than I I could ever know. I just love this boy so much. It's, I think it's really the love of Jesus it, it placed in my heart because I could not love this way. In more than 100 nations, God's people were moved to reflect His love in action, and children found love and belonging. Our culture in Guatemala is not an adoption culture at all. 
But when I met her, it was because here we, they, they show you a picture of her and they tell you she's going to be mine. Once I saw her, I said, okay, she's mine. Від того, що ви зробили, дарували щастя одній, а якщо двоє, чи троє, чи більше, то це дуже-дуже велика милість для вас, для всіх, для нас. І завжди ми повинні пам'ятати, що добре там, де ми маємо жертовні. Today, God continues to call his followers throughout the body of Christ so that every orphan and vulnerable child can know his unfailing love. Will you say yes to be with the child who needs you now? So some church in Africa that none of y'all have heard of, unless you're familiar with the Orphan Sunday story, decides, hey, we're gonna do something. Some church with very little finances, and they step out and say, we're, we're gonna do something about this. And the seeds of Orphan Sunday, now that transcends across the globe, started in that place. And why I say that is, is it would be easy for us to look at the numbers and to look at the problem and be like, but seriously, what can we do? And I would ask, not what we can do, but what can God do through his people? We believe God can do a lot. And so um, here's the reality. I, I don't profess to know, and I want you to hear me. I don't profess to know specifically what God would have you do in light of this crisis. But what is, uh, seems apparent, giving the scriptural narrative, giving the problem and what we read God's heart is for orphans and our story as Jesus people, given all of that information, it seems quite clear that God is not okay with what's currently happening. That God would want more people to play more roles than are being currently played. And these kids need homes. And not only do they need homes, but they need the right kinds of homes, right? That we, we don't want these kids just in any old home. We would love these kids to be in homes where they're gonna receive the love and the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That these kids would grow up with parents who, who would say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna love these kids like my own, and I'm gonna share Jesus with them. One of the things that I love about you all, and I love about Edgewater Alliance Church, and I loved it before I even came here and when I was interviewing for the student pastor job, was that this was a church that was on mission. And we would say things like every man, woman, and child, and wherever we live, work, and play, and and one of the things I've heard about foster care, and it's also true of adoption, is it's like the ultimate form of hospitality. That it is literally opening up your door and inviting the mission field to come and live in your house. If you're struggling with how, how do I reach people for Jesus? Well, I mean, one great way is to open your door and let them come live with you. It's hard for that not to have an impact. And one of the questions that I want to lay before you this morning, again, I don't profess to know if God even wants you to do this, but is it possible that there is room in your home and in your heart for one of these kids? John Mark Comer writes this. This is another encouraging story. He says, a lethal combination of Western sexual ethics the breakdown of the family, generational poverty, the opioid epidemic, and the war on drugs has left thousands of little kids without a home or family. That's the bad news. But here's what he writes about what happened in his church and in his community. He was in the Portland area. He says, families across our church are meeting this crisis, not with an angry tweet at a politician, but with quiet, humble love, welcoming children into their homes for as long as it takes 
the families to heal. Around 1,200 of the 1,500 foster families in my city are Christians recruited from local churches. That is remarkable. Let me say that again. Around 1,200 of the 1,500 foster families in my cities, writing of the greater Portland area, are Christians recruited from local churches. To which I say, amen. And why not here? Why not here in Volusia County? That God loves these kids. That God has saved us and adopted us into his family. And I don't think God is okay with the current crisis. And the people of God need to have some courage to meet this crisis. And I understand the barriers in doing so. I understand the hesitancy. I understand that there are things about this that look extremely difficult. But again, I want to remind you of what I said on the onset of our time about the gospel, that our adoption was costly. And so if we look at this crisis and we're like, oh, this is gonna be hard, this is gonna be painful. I think it is gonna be those things. The question is, are we going to arise and be the church that Jesus wants us to be? And again, I, I don't profess to know what role, if any, you are called to play in this current crisis. I think that's between you and God. But what I think we need to be open to as the people of God is a conversation, an open-handed one, where we ask God, hey, in light of your heart for these orphans, in light of the adoption story, in light of the current need that there is in our community and around the globe, Lord Jesus, is there anything that you want me to do? And so all I'm asking of you this morning is that you would be willing to have that conversation, that you would be willing to pray and ask God if there is any way in which you are to be involved. And here's what I want by way of response this morning. If you're willing to have that conversation, if you're willing to say that prayer, and that's all I'm asking at this moment in time, would you stand if you're able? Would you stand right now if you're willing to say that prayer, if you're willing to have that conversation? I'm just asking, are you willing to have the conversation? I want to pray over those of you who are standing. And then I'm gonna share a couple other things with you as we conclude. But let me pray for you. Father in heaven, I thank you for our adoption story. I thank you for the blood of Jesus that was shed for us so that we might experience life and home and love and grace. I pray that we would be a church that faithfully preaches the gospel. I pray that we would also be a church that faithfully lives out the gospel. And one expression of living out the gospel is caring for orphans. And so I pray in the name of Jesus that Edgewater Alliance Church would do that really, really well in a way that the world and the community is bewildered by our care and our love for those who need homes. And so right now I pray over my brothers and sisters who are standing in this moment. I thank you for their willingness to have the conversation and I pray that you would speak into their lives. I pray that you would lead them. I pray that you would give them wisdom and discernment if you have a role for them to play. And if you do, what that role is. 
And I pray that they would be supported well by this church. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. I wanna leave you, for those of you who stood, with a, a couple pieces of advice on how I would recommend this conversation that you said you're willing to have with God to go. The first thing that I would say is breathe, all right? I know this is an overwhelming topic, an overwhelming conversation, and maybe one of you saw your spouse stand and you were like, I wasn't gonna stand and it's a thing. Breathe, breathe. You're probably not gonna have a kid in your home by Tuesday, all right? It's probably not gonna happen. What I would say though, is I would just ask that you take this conversation seriously. And one of the ways, as Ron had preached about a while back, that we can take some conversations seriously is by fasting. And so I would ask that you, and if you're married, you and your spouse, fast one meal with the focus of that time being we're fasting this meal to have a conversation with the Lord about what he wants us to do as it relates to the foster and orphan crisis. And then as it relates to this idea, and I want you guys to do that if you're married as a couple, but if you're married, I also want you to process graciously with your spouse. So one of the things that, that I've heard that is normative in this, uh, in this realm is that one spouse will be more on board than the other. Typically, I've heard that is the female. Go figure, all right? So the motherly instinct is like, let's do it. Let's save the babies. And the dad is like, what's going on, all right? And so what I would say is, is this is a very significant endeavor and neither one of you want to drag your spouse along unwillingly. Because what will happen inevitably is that there will be part of either the foster or adoptive journey that will be difficult. And um, what, will, what could happen is, and you don't want this to happen, is you don't want one spouse looking at the other and being like, I didn't want to do this in the first place or I wasn't ready. And Pastor Connor is not looking at going into full-time marriage counseling. Let me tell you what, all right? So don't do that. Process graciously with your spouse, discern together. And honestly, what I would say is, is if, if a spouse isn't ready, like, please don't move forward. Don't move forward until you're ready together, but process together. And one of the things that's helpful in processing is finding resources. So the Nigan Finds are much more familiar with foster care than we are adoption at this point. And so if foster care is the area that you're interested in, one resource that I would recommend to you is Foster the Family by Jamie C. Finn. It is an excellent resource, a biblical perspective on Christian foster care. If you're even considering being a foster parent and you know and love Jesus, please read this book, all right? But whatever kind of area you're looking at going into, whether it's adoption or support or foster or guardian ad litem, kind of whatever you, you sense maybe you're supposed to do, um, get some resources and help you unpack that. And finally, the last one is, if you sense after this conversation that the Lord does want you to do something, and again, no guilt from me. Like if you have the conversation and you're like, man, I I'm not sensing at all that the Lord's leading me in this area and maybe there's another area God wants me to be involved in. Like God bless you. This is not a guilt sermon. You just process it and pray. But if you feel like this is an area where the Lord is calling you to step up, whether that be to adopt a child foster a child or support those who do, then communicate with EAC and let us help you get plugged in. So if you're saying, I want to support families, we'll get you plugged into every child initiative that does just that. If you're saying we want to adopt or we want to foster, we want an army behind you. We want individuals specifically that we would pair with you and say, we're going to be in your corner and support you. And here's a stat that is crazy. So I was at a dinner about a month ago for foster leaders in our community. And one of the stats I heard was this, that the national retention rate for foster parents is 35%. That is really bad. 
The national retention rate is 35% for foster parents. That gives you some insight that it's not always easy, right? Check this out. This is the stat I heard. When a couple is supported by a local church, you know what the national retention rate is? 95%. 95% retention rate. So we need people who are gonna adopt, we need people who are gonna foster, and we need people who are gonna support those who do. So thank you to those of you who are, being, who are willing to have that conversation. And here's some stuff that I would just submit to you that you would allow to structure that conversation that you're going to have, okay? Well, I love you, Edgewater Alliance Church. Go buy some coffee in the name of Jesus. And I'll leave you with a line that we have said here a lot. It's a good one. Go be the church. Blessings. Thank you for joining us today as we journey through what it means to think like Jesus so that we can live more like him. If you'd like more information about Edgewater Alliance Church, its various ministries, or how to partner with us through giving, visit our website, edgewateralliance.org. Until next time, blessings.